Hello, regulars. You're listening to Floor by Floor, a Tower of God podcast discussing the latest chapters of the webtoon. I'm Reziat. And I'm Viralane. And we're your hosts. Welcome to the ninth floor, where we will be discussing chapter 574, or season 3, episode 157. Things are starting to pick up really fast. But first, let's start with a recap. It opens with Chomre taunting Kun for never standing a chance against him. He knew about the traitors, and they are no threat to him. He has figured out that Jinsung and the traitors are working together, and Kun thinks he's been caught. Now Bomb and company are in danger. There's a time skip to a few minutes prior, and Bomb and company are headed to the escape submarine when two family branch leaders, Umtiti and El Baba, cut them off. Goruro, their insider, has been caught. The branch leaders send their beasts to destroy the submarine, and Gororo urges the regulars to get inside the submarine. Cha shows up to fight the Grey Wolf Beast. He keeps his promise to Jinsung and tells Bom that his master has escaped first. Suddenly, there's a rumbling and a massive turtle shows up from underneath them. We cut to Traumare telling Kun that he never trusted anyone on the battleship, even his children, and since he trusts no one, he has never been betrayed. We cut back to Cha telling the regulars to get in the submarine first while the others fight off the beasts and family branch heads. Gororo unleashes a multitude of tiny, six-legged lizards from his mouth and they attack the badger beast. Suddenly, Bong Bong appears, and Kun and Dorsey pop out. The massive turtle's head rises up and takes a bite out of the catwalk just as Kun and Dorsey dodge. A spear flies at Kun's back and his shield is seen cracking. Bomb and Rock reach out to Kun, and there's a moment where Kun really thinks he's going to die. We cut to Tiara and Matt running through the garden next to the hotel. Matt is curious why they are withdrawing, and Tiara says that it's their family head's orders that if things get difficult, to leave the tackle men and the target together and escape. We cut the coon's lighthouse glowing brightly. Gustonk pops out and he disintegrates the spear. He says he knew he'd be able to trust Coon to be by Bomb's side at the most critical moment. Gustong goes on to say that he came over twice, but hasn't been able to see his friend's face yet. He tells the family branch heads to tell Tramare to come out or else he'll take everything for himself. And that's what happened in the last chapter. And this week's chapter makes no pauses and picks up immediately right after that. It opens with everyone being shocked that Gustang popped out of Kun's lighthouse. Kun thinks to himself that Gustang must have done something to his lighthouse while he was in their prison in order to show up when he was with Baum and take him. Realizing that, Kun urges Baum to run away. Gustang tells Kun to go, and Kun is shocked. He says he'll block the branch heads, but he wants the submarine to go to the location he specified on Kun's lighthouse. If Kun turns him down, he'll just take the irregular and kill the rest of them. Kun grumbles, but he tells Ndorsi to head to the submarine. Kun and Ndorsi reunite with the others as he wonders what Gustang is plotting. Gustang taunts the branch leaders, calling them bugs and moths that fly towards the light, even though it'll burn them. POV switched to Traumarai, alone in the lobby. There's a blue lighthouse on the floor behind him. Holin is shown buried under rubble, calling out to Traumarai. Chamurai interestingly refers to Holin by name. Holin finally gets to deliver the burning message from Gustang in the form of an enchantment on his tongue that begins speaking in Gustang's voice around his own voice. Holin apologizes profusely and cries as Gustang's message plays. You've been like this for a while. What is so frightening about it? You, who used to control everything better than others, hesitated to seize what you truly desired when it appeared right in front of you. You are a coward. But remember, Traumare, the important thing is that if you don't seize it with your own hands, it can be taken away from you right before your eyes. If you make another foolish choice this time, I will burn everything you have to ashes. Traumare frowns. Holin begs for mercy as Traumare scolds him for cowardly allowing Gustang to put words in his mouth to come back alive and alone tells him he will reward him by pulling out his tongue. Not much of a reward, if you ask me. Ouch. But right as he bends down to do that, the blue lighthouse behind him whirs up. Chamurai turns around to look at the lighthouse and sees a video feed of Gustang standing at the docks, alerting Chamurai to his presence on his battleship. The POV switches back to Gustang. Goruro measures up what they're up against. Three branch heads. And what could that even do against a family head? Gororo turns to Baum and yells at him that this is a great opportunity to get out like they should. Baum agrees, 
But then Kuhn stops them. Kuhn says they can't go yet, that they've not gotten what they've wanted, and that if they go now, they'll forever be stuck under the influence of the family heads. Kuhn assures himself not to be scared, as there's still room for negotiations when Tramurai decides to show up. Gustang looks back and sees Kuhn and the others aren't moving. What the heck is he thinking? We also think the same thing. What is he thinking? He's lost his marbles is what he's done. It cuts back to Tramurai, who immediately teleports to the dock in front of everyone via spatial distortion, and there's more panic. Tramurai and Gustang begin to banter coldly. What do you want, Gustang? I never invited you to my home. As they go back and forth, Kuhn is watching, seemingly waiting for an opportunity to interject. Further watching this, Goruro thinks, Of course it'd be nice if Gustang and Tramurai fought, but he wants no part in this, and understandably so. Gustang basically calls Tramurai a hikikomori too scared to go outside, and before he can finish the rest of his insult, Tramurai slashes off the lit end of Gustang's cigarette with a warning strike. It falls to the ground. The branch leaders all freak out again. Tramurai says, Don't misunderstand me, Gustang. This is my home, and it's a no smoking area. As he flips off Gustang from above, his eel beast Fandor harp coiling back around his arm. This panel is iconic, and I can't read that with a straight face because it was just that amazing. It is just a meme at this point. I've already seen it Photoshop a skill issue on the speech bubble. <laughs> as amused as we are, Gustang scoffs at Tramurai in response, tells Tramurai that he's become arrogant in a time that they haven't seen each other. Tramurai spits back that Gustang has lost his manners in the same amount of time says that if Gustang has finally shown himself here, then he must be prepared for the consequences of his actions. And with that, Gustang just smiles up at him. He starts telling Tramurai off, posturing in front of his own children, running away from the things that actually matter like a coward, and he throws a cigarette aside. Tramurai prickles and begins shouting as he starts taking control of the branch leader's divine beasts with his anima powers. He yells at Gustang to shut up, that he warned him that this is his home and everything in it, even the floating specks of dust, belong to him. And within his home, nothing is allowed to disobey him. The divine beasts change forms as he does so into whitish creatures and power up as Tramurai takes control of them. Tramurai explains this conveniently. Gororo suddenly covers his mouth his own lizard divine beasts threatening to escape his body, and Bomb realizes even the leviathan inside of him is reacting to Tramurai's command. Tramurai then goes on to assert that this battleship full of his divine beasts is the best battlefield for him to fight in, shouts angrily that this is his domain. In response to this, Gustang quietly begins summoning a ton of sharp weapons from his inventory through small Shinsu portals, and tersely commands them to shred Tramurai apart. And the chapter ended there. Only one will win. And it's gonna be Kuhn, apparently. <laughs> How is he gonna get in between this? What is he doing? What are the others standing around for? Is someone gonna die, or is there gonna be an interruption as usual? We have no clue. It is the worst cliffhanger. Kuhn has lost his marbles, like you said. Why does he think he can negotiate with two family heads, especially after both of them have threatened him with death? And sure, maybe Kuhn's a little bit allergic to death, but these are family heads, man. They could snap and he could just blow up. But he's got a plan in that little head of his, apparently. I just don't know if this is an actual plan or if this is just plain recklessness. It's a reckless plan is what it is. He's insane, especially for him just straight up having it set up for Tramurai to see that Gustang was there via his lighthouse back at the hotel lobby. It was his lighthouse. It was a blue one that was just there, and it wears up and shows Gustang, and Tramurai frowns. He made Tramurai frown. Aren't lighthouses expensive for him to just be leaving them around places just to set up his plan? He's broken quite a few over the last decade or so. 
Apparently not that much. Then again, he might be dipping into Bum's deep pockets. <laughs> this just fugs money. No big deal. They deserve it. <laughs> I find that interesting, though, for technical aspects. Like, one, his Shinsu control seems to be wide range now. Or the docks aren't that far away from the hotel. Maybe it's underneath? Because Kuhn is literally controlling this remotely. And we don't know exactly spatially where these two locations are. So it's like, whoa. We know he's talented, but I don't know if he's talented enough to control something that far away. It could just also be something CU overlooked. Maybe we're looking too much into it. I want to keep my faith in CU, man. <laughs> I don't know. Because we still haven't gotten an explanation about how Endorsey and Kuhn got there. Are we ever going to get it? For real? <laughs> they just suddenly decided like, poof, and Tramurai doesn't give a crap because he thinks he's won, maybe? But come on. Maybe it's just a foundation for another little gotcha. And we think that Kuhn is being insane when it's actually part of a bigger plan. Who knows? The fact that he set up, though, a lighthouse to inform Tramurai, maybe he cracked a little deal of like, hey, if... Gaston shows up, I'll let you know if you let me go, kind of thing. But again, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. But it certainly seems like Kuhn didn't even know Gaston was like able to teleport through his lighthouse in the first place. Yeah. Everybody was super shocked about that. Please see who gives us answers. But I think my favorite thing about this chapter so far is Gaston and Tramurai interacting. This goofy middle finger panel has made my year. Like I said before, I've already seen it shopped with the speech bubble saying skill issue on it. It's amazing. <laughs> but beefing grandpa jokes aside, it struck me during their interactions that Tramurai and Gustang are very animated people in each other's presence. Tramurai actually scowled and yelled. Gustang scoffed and smiled. What? It's kind of like they only really come to life or act like themselves around their friends. Maybe what the Ten Family Heads actually need here is a good old family reunion to get their heads on back straight. They need to talk and make up or fight it out and forgive each other or something. Because as it currently stands, Hansung was right. They've certainly forsaken their humanity for whatever it is their goals actually were when they first took on the immortality contract over thousands, thousands of years ago. Which kind of led me to wonder, when Gustang tells Chamurai not to make another stupid decision and not to run away like he always does in his message via Holin, what if Gustang's goal is also to slap some sense back into Chamurai? Or at least try and remind him what's actually important here. Irregular aside, they've stagnated over millennia, and have been sweeping under the carpet this long-standing issue with Fug and the actual history of the Ten Great Families' journey up the tower. And, well, Bomb's presence being there now means that it's time for upheaval. I would be super excited to see if the goal of this is actually to unite the Ten Family Leaders once more. This is all just them posturing and acting all tough and being babies. They just happen to be very powerful babies <laughs> that need to figure their stuff out. They all need something new and exciting. A part of me still thinks that Jihad is just like ultra gaslighting everyone in one way or another, or has manipulated them about something. I can see the ending now. Bomb kills Jihad and everyone's like, oh, that's cool. And they're all <laughs> friends again. He was an asshole anyone. Nobody liked him. I think everyone liked him. They've become very disillusioned with him. But there hasn't been any room for negotiation in that table, too. Hmm. See you, please. We need answers. You're dying. Everything leads to questions. It's just an ocean of question marks. And we're drowning. And hopefully next week we'll finally get answers. Because the whole panel with the Leviathan reacting to Traumarize Anima Command has me going, ooh. I feel like Kuhn's plan to try to cut any sort of deal is going to completely go awry. I hope that CU gives us the Leviathan dumping Traumarai's trauma back onto him. Imagine, we get backstory, we get some answers, and 
perhaps some character development for Chamurai himself. What if he becomes disgusted at seeing who and what he's become? Or what if he totally flips out and it's the Lopo Bia family that's going to get wrecked? Who knows? Because we're now in the action chapters and the only answers we can get is the next chapter. Like always. What do you think? Do you want to see them fight or do you want to see them talk no jutsu it out? Their bantering is so amusing. Because it feels like Gustav is just picking on Tramare and, and Tramare is like, This is my house. You can't say that to me here. And, and Gustav's just like, ha ha, stupid idiot. Stupid nerd. <laughs> As he pushes his glasses up with one finger. You see, I'm a nerd. I can insult my own nerd people. I find it interesting that Gustav kept calling him a, a scaredy cat and, and that he's not acting like himself. And I wonder if that's part of the memories that a part of his personality is definitely gone. That maybe he asked Jod, help me out. I don't want to be shy anymore. And by removing a portion of his memories, like we were saying before, become more comfortable with doing these inhuman experimentations and stuff like that. But again, we don't really know what's inside the Leviathan, so it's all just ideas of what the heck is in there. Bomb seems to have an idea, but unfortunately, with the dramatic irony present currently, we don't know. He's not going to tell us. There's a lot of things he hasn't told us, which is interesting as the protagonist. Well, he needs to start spilling the tea. Maybe he'll do it next chapter. Hmm, Shinsu tea. I wonder what it tastes like. Well, maybe we'll find out next week. Thanks so much for joining us, regulars. We'll see you on the next floor. Goodbye. Have a good one.